Hello and welcome back to SuperCloud 2 where we examine the intersection of cloud and data in the 2020s. My name is Dave Vellante and our SuperCloud panel, our power panel is back. Maribel Lopez is the founder and principal analyst at Lopez Research. Sanjeev Mohan is former Gartner analyst and principal at Sanjmo and Keith Townsend is the CTO advisor. Folks, welcome back and thanks for your participation today. Good to see you. Hey, Grace. Great to see you. Thanks. Uh, let me start, Maribel, with you. Bob Muglia, uh, we, we, we had a conversation as part of SuperCloud the other day, and he said, Tava, you know, I like the work you've done, but you got to simplify this a little bit. So he said, quote, a SuperCloud is a platform. He said, think of it as a platform that provides programmatically consistent services hosted on heterogeneous uh, cloud providers. And then Nelu Mihai said, well, wait a minute, this is just going to create more stovepipes. We need more standards and an architecture which is kind of what Berkeley Sky Computing Initiative is all about. So there's a sort of a debate going on, is SuperCloud an architecture, a platform, or maybe it's just another buzzword. Maribel, do you have a thought on this? Well, the easy answer would be to say it's just a buzzword and then we could just you know, kill the conversation and, and be done with it. But I think the term, uh, it's more than that, right? The term actually isn't new. Uh, you can go back to at least 2016 and find references to SuperCloud in uh, Cornell University or assist and other uh, documents. So having said this, I think we've been talking about SuperCloud for a while, so I assume it's more than just a fancy buzzword. But I think it really speaks to that undeniable trend of moving towards an abstraction layer to deal with the chaos of what we consider managing multiple uh, public and private clouds today, right? So. You know, one definition of the technology platform speaks to a set of services that allows companies to build and run uh, that technology smoothly without worrying about the underlying infrastructure, which really gets back <laughs> to something that Bob said. Um, and you know, some of the question is where that lives. You know, you could and you could call that an abstraction layer. You could call it uh, cross cross cloud services, hybrid cloud management. Uh, so I see momentum there, like legitimate momentum with enterprise IT buyers that you know, are trying to deal with the fact that they have multiple clouds now. Uh, so where I think we're moving is trying to define what are the specific attributes and frameworks of that that would make it so that it could be consistent across clouds. You know, what is that layer? And maybe that's what the super cloud is. Uh, but one of the things I struggle with with super cloud is, you know, what are we, what are we really trying to do here? Are we trying to create differentiated services in the super cloud layer? Is a super cloud just another variant of what you know AWS, GCP, or others do? You know, you you spoke in Walmart about its cloud native platform, and that's an example of somebody deciding to do it themselves <laughs> because they need to deal with this today and not wait for some big standards thing to happen. So whatever it is, you know, I do think it's something. I think it is, you know, we're we're trying to um, maybe create an architecture out of it would would be a better way of saying it so that it does get to those set of principles. But it also needs to be edge aware. I think whenever we talk about super cloud, we're always talking about like the big centralized cloud. And I think we need to think about all the distributed clouds that we're looking at as in edge as well. So that might be one of the ways that super cloud evolves. So thank you, Maribel. Keith, you know, Brian Gracely, Gracely's Law, things kind of repeat themselves. We've seen it all before. And so this, what Muglia brought to, to the forefront is this idea of you know, a platform where the, the platform provider is really responsible for the architecture. Of course, the drawback is that you get a, a bunch of stovepipe architectures, but practically speaking, that's kind of the way the industry has always evolved, right? So if we look at this from the practitioner's perspective, and we talk about platforms, traditionally vendors have provided the platforms for us, whether it's a distribution of Linux managed by, or uh, give, provided by Red Hat, Windows Server, .NET, databases, Oracle. We think of those as platforms, things that are fundamental we can build on top. SuperCloud isn't today that. It is a framework or idea, kind of a visionary goal to get to a point, point that we can have a platform or a framework. But the, what we're seeing repeated throughout the industry in customers, whether it's the Walmarts that's kind of supersized the idea of SuperCloud, or if it's 
uh, regular end user organizations that are coming out with platform groups, groups who normalize uh, cloud native infrastructure, AWS, multi-cloud, VMware resources to look like one thing internally to their developers. We're seeing this trend that there's a desire for a platform that provides the capabilities of a super cloud. Thank you for that. Um, Sanjeev, we often use Snowflake as a super cloud example, and that would presumably be a platform, you know, with an architecture that's determined by the vendor. Um, maybe Databricks is pushing for a more open architecture, maybe that more of that Nirvana uh, that we were talking about before to solve the super clouds. But regardless, the practitioner discussions show, at least currently, there's not a lot of cross cloud data sharing. Um, I think it could be a killer use case, egress charges are a, a barrier, but, but how do you see it? Will, will that change? Will, will we hide that underlying complexity and start sharing data across cloud? Is that something that you think Snowflake or others will be able to, to achieve? So I, I think we are already starting to see some of that happen. Snowflake is, is definitely one example that gets cited uh, a lot, but even, you know, we don't talk about MongoDB in this light, but you could have a MongoDB cluster, for instance, with nodes uh, sitting in different cloud providers. So there are companies that are starting to do it. The, the advantage that these companies have, let's, let's take Snowflake as an example, is it's a centralized proprietary platform and they are building the capabilities that are needed for super cloud. So they're building things like uh, you can push down your data transformations. They have the entire security and privacy suite. Uh, data ops, they're adding those capabilities. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it'll be very soon, we will see them offer data observability. So it's all works great as long as you are in, in one uh, platform. And if you want resilience, then Snowflake, SuperCloud, great example. But if your primary goal is to choose the most cost effective service, irrespective of which cloud it sits in, then things start for falling uh, 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 sideways. For example, I may be a very big Snowflake user and I like Snowflake's resilience. Uh, you know, I can move from one cloud to another cloud, like Snowflake does it for me. But what if I want to train a very large model? Maybe Databricks is a better platform for that. So how do I do uh, move my workload from one, platform to another platform, that tooling does not exist. So we need uh, sort of a hybrid cross, cross cloud data ops platform. Walmart has done a great job, but they build it by themselves. Not every company is Walmart. So we need some, like uh, Maribel and Keith said, we need standards, we need uh, reference architectures, uh, we need some sort of a cost control. Uh, I was just reading recently Accenture uh, has, uh, has been public about their AWS bill. Every time they get the bill is tens of millions of lines, tens of millions, because they have over a thousand teams using AWS. If we have not been able to corral our usage of a single cloud. Now we're talking about super cloud. We've got multiple clouds and hybrid on-prem and edge. So till we've got some, some cross-platform tooling in place, I think this will still take uh, quite some time for, uh, for, for it to take shape. It's interesting, Maribel. Uh, Walmart would tell you that they're on-prem infrastructure is cheaper to run than the stuff in the cloud, but at the same time, they want the flexibility and the resiliency of their, their three, you know, legged stool model. Um, so the point that Hasanji was making about hybrid, it's an interesting balance, isn't it? Between getting, you know, your lowest cost and at the same time having best of breed and scale. It 
it's basically what you're trying to optimize for, as you said, right? And and by the way, to the earlier point, not everybody is at Walmart scale, so it's not actually cheaper for everybody to right. uh, have the purchasing power to make the cloud cheaper to, to have it on-prem. But I think what you see almost every company, large or small, moving towards is this concept of like, where do I find the agility? And is the agility in building the infrastructure for me? And typically the the thing that gives you outside advantage as an organization is not how you constructed your cloud computing infrastructure. It might be how you structured your data analytics as an example, which cloud is related to that. Uh, but you know, how, how do you marry those two things? And getting back to sort of Sanjeev's point, you know, we're in a real struggle now where, you know, on one hand, we want to have best of breed services. And on the other hand, we want it to be really easy to manage, secure, do data governance. And those two things are really at odds with each other right now. So, you know, if you want all the knobs and switches of a service like geospatial analytics and BigQuery, you're going to have to use Google tools, right? Um, Whereas if you want visibility across, you know, all the clouds for your application of state and understand the security and governance of that, you're kind of looking for something that's more cross-cloud tooling at that point. Uh, but whenever you talk to somebody about cross-cloud tooling, they look at you like, that's not really possible. So, so it's a very interesting time in the market. Now we're kind of layering this concept of super cloud on it. And some people think super cloud's about, you know, basically multi-cloud tooling. And some people think it's about a whole new architectural stack. So we're just not there yet, but it's not all about cost. I mean, cloud has not been about cost for a very, very long time. Cloud has been about how do you really make the most of your data? And this gets back to uh, cross-cloud services like um, Snowflake. You know, what, why, why did they even exist? They existed because we had data everywhere but we need to treat data as a unified object so that we can analyze it and get insight from it. And so that's where some of the benefit of these cross-cloud services are moving today. Still a long way to go though, Dave. Hey, uh, um, I reached out to my friends at ETR given the macro headwinds and you're right, Maribel, it's yeah. not, not, cloud hasn't really been about, you know, just about cost savings, but I reached out to the ETR guys and, and, and asked them, how are customers, what's your data show in terms of how customers are, are dealing with the economic headwinds. And they said by far their number one strategy to cut cost is consolidating redundant vendors. And a distant second, but still you know, notable, was optimizing cloud costs. Maybe using reserve instances or using you know, more you know, volume buying. Um, I, nowhere in there, and I asked them to, could you go look at, see if you can find it. Do, or do we see repatriation? And you hear this a yeah. lot, you hear people whisper in our, as analysts, you better look into that repatriation trend. It's pretty big. <laughs> you can't find it, <laughs> but, but, you know, to, to, but, but some of the Walmarts in the world, maybe they're not repatriating, but they maybe have better cost structure on-prem. Keith, what are you seeing from the practitioners that you talk to in terms of how they're dealing with, the, with these headwinds? Yeah, I just got into a conversation about this just this morning with uh, Enrico Signoretti who is an analyst over at GigaOM, uh, he's reading the same headlines. Repatriation is happening at large scale. I think this is kind of, you know, we, we have these quiet terms now. We have quiet quitting, we have quiet hiring. I think we have quiet repatriation. Yes. Most people haven't done away with their data centers. They're still there, whether they're completely on-premises data centers and they own assets or their partnerships with QTX, Equinix, et cetera, they have these private cloud re, uh, resources. What I'm seeing practically is a rebalancing of workloads. Do I really need to pay AWS for this instance of SAP that's on 24 hours a day versus just having it on-prem? moving it back to my data center. I've talked to quite a few customers who were early on to moving their static SAP workloads onto the public cloud and they simply moved them back. Surprising, I was at VMware Explorer and we can talk about this a little bit later on, but there are customers, net new, not a lot, that were born in the cloud and they get to this point where their workloads are static. And they look at something like a Kubernetes or a OpenShift or VMware Tanzu, and they ask the question, do I need the scalability of cloud? I might consider being a net new VMware customer. 
to deliver this base capability. So are we seeing repatriation as the number one reason? No, I think IT, internal IT uh, operations are just naturally coming to this realization, hey, I have these resources on premises, the private cloud technologies have moved uh, far along enough that I can just simply move this workload back. I'm not calling it repatriation. I'm calling it right sizing for the operating model that I have. That makes sense. Yeah. So if I, if, if I miss something, Dave, uh, while we are on this topic of repatriation, I, I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm actually surprised that, you know, uh, repat we are talking about repatriation as, as a very big thing. I think repatriation is happening, no doubt, but it's such a small percentage of cloud migration that it, to me, it's a rounding error, in my opinion. I think the, there's a bigger problem. The problem is that people don't know where the cost is. If they knew where the cost was being wasted in the cloud, they could do something about it. But if you don't know, then the easy answer is cost, cloud cost a lot and moving it back to on-premises. I mean, take like Capital One as an example, they got rid of all the data centers. Where are they going to uh, repatriate to? They're all in the cloud at this point. So I think my point is that data observability is one of the reasons, one of the places that has seen a lot of traction is because of cost. Data observability, when it first came into existence, it was all about data quality. Then it was all about data pipeline reliability. And now the number one killer use case is FinOps. Maribel, you had a comment? Yeah, I'm kind of in violent agreement with both Sanjeev and Keith. So what are, what, what are we seeing here, right? So the, the first thing that we see is that many people wildly overspent in the big public cloud. They had stranded cloud credits, so to speak, right? Uh, the second thing is, some of them still had infrastructure that was useful. So why not use it if you find the right workloads to what Keith was talking about, if they were more static workloads, if it was already there. So there is a balancing that's going on. And then I think fundamentally from a trend standpoint, you know, uh, it, these things aren't binary, right? Everybody, for a while, everything was going to go to the public cloud. And then people are like, oh, it's kind of expensive, right? Then they're like, oh, no, they're going to bring it all on-prem because it's really expensive. And it's like, well, uh, that doesn't necessarily get me some of the new features and functionalities I might want for some of my new workloads. So, you know, I'm going to put the workloads that have a certain set of characteristics that require a cloud in the cloud, and if I have enough capability on-prem and enough IT resources to manage certain things on site, then I'm going to do that there because that's a, a more cost-effective thing for me to do. It's not binary. That's why we went to hybrid. And then we went to multi just to describe the fact that people added multiple public clouds. And you know now we're talking about super, right? So I, I don't look at it as a one-size-fits-all for any of this. You know, a, a number of practitioners leading up to SuperCloud 2 have told us that they're solving their cloud complexity by going with mono cloud. So they're putting on the blinders, <laughs> even though across the organization, there's other groups using other clouds. They're like, in my group, we use AWS, or in my group, we use Azure. And those guys over there, they use Google. And you know, we just kind of keep it separate. Are you guys hearing this in your view? Is that you know risky? Are they are they are they missing out on some potential to tap uh, best of breed? What do you guys think about that? Everybody thinks they're mono cloud. Is anybody really mono cloud? It's like a group is mono cloud, right. right? This genie is out of the bottle. We're not putting the genie back in the bottle. You might think you're mono cloud, and you go like three doors down and figure out that the guy or gal is on a fundamentally different cloud, running some analytics workload that you didn't know about. So, you know, to Sanjeev's earlier point, they don't even know where their cloud spend is. So, I think the concept of mono cloud, how that's actually really realized by practitioners is primary and then secondary sources, right? So they have a primary cloud that they run most of their stuff on and that they try to optimize. And, you know, we still have forked workloads. You know, somebody decides, okay, you know, this, this SAP runs really well on this or these analytics workloads run really well on that cloud. And maybe that's how they parse it. But if you really looked at it, there's very few companies, if you really peeked under the hood and did an analysis that you could find an actual mono cloud structure. They just want to pull it back in and make it more manageable. And, and I respect that. You want to do what you can to try to streamline the complexity of that. So yeah, we're, sorry, go ahead, Keith. 
Yeah, we're we're doing this thing where we review an AWS service every day. Just you know, in your inbox, get learn and learn about a new AWS uh, service cursory. There's 238 AWS products just on the AWS cloud itself. Some of them are redundant, but you, you get the idea. So the concept of monocloud, I, I'm in violent agreement with Maribel on this, that uh, yes, a group might say, I want a primary cloud. And that primary cloud may be the AWS. But have you tried to license Oracle database on AWS? It is really tempting to license Oracle on Oracle Cloud, Microsoft on Microsoft, and I can't get RDS anywhere but Amazon. So while I'm driven to desire the simplicity, the reality is whether it's via M&A, uh, licensing, data sovereignty, I am forced into a multi-cloud uh, management style, but I do uh, agree most people kind of do this one, this primary cloud, secondary cloud, and I guarantee you, you're going to have a third cloud or a fourth cloud, whether you want to or not, via shadow IT, latency, technical reasons, et cetera. Uh, thank you. Uh, Sanjeev, you had a comment? Yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to, uh, to mention as an organization, I'm complete agreement. No organization is mono cloud, at least, you know, if it's a large organization. Uh, large organizations use all kinds of combinations of, of cloud providers. But when you talk about a single workload, that's where the problem arises. As Keith said, there are 238 services in AWS. How in the world am I going to be an expert in AWS but then say, let me bring GCP or Azure into a single workload. And that's where I think we will, we uh, probably will still see monocloud as being predominant, you know, because the, the team has developed its expertise on a particular cloud provider and they just don't have the time of the day to go learn uh, yet another stack. However, there are some uh, interesting things that are happening. For example, if you look at uh, a multi-cloud example where Oracle and Microsoft Azure ha have that interconnect. So that's, that's a beautiful thing that they've done because now in the newest iteration, it's literally a few clicks. And then behind the scene, your .NET application and your Oracle database in OCI will be configured, the identities in Active Directory are federated, and you can just start using uh, a, a database in one cloud, which is OCI, and an application, your .NET in, in Azure. So till we see this kind of a solution coming out of the providers, I think it's, it's unrealistic to expect the end users to be able to figure out multiple clouds. Well, I, I have to share with you, I, I can't remember if he said this on camera or if it was off camera, so I'll, I'll hold off. I won't tell you who it is, but this individual was sort of complaining a little bit, saying with AWS, um, I can take their best AI tools like SageMaker and I can run them on my Snowflake. He said, I can't do that in Google. Google forces me to go to BigQuery if I want their excellent AI tools. So he was sort of pushing kind of tweaking a little bit some of the vendor talk that, oh yeah, we're so customer focused. Uh, not to pick on Google, but I mean, everybody, right, will say that. And, and then you say, well, why don't, if you're so customer focused, why wouldn't you do ABC? So it's going to be interesting to see who leads that integration uh, and how broadly uh, you know, it's applied. But I digress. Keith, at our first SuperCloud event that was on August 9th, and it was only a few months after Broadcom announced the VMware acquisition, a lot of people, myself included, said, all right, cuts are coming. Generally, Tanzu is probably going to be under the radar, but it's SuperCloud 22 and presumably VMware Explorer, the company really, or certainly the US, touted its Tanzu capabilities. I wasn't at VMware Explorer Europe, but I bet you heard similar things. Hock Tan has been blogging and very vocal about cross-cloud services and multi-cloud, you know, which doesn't happen without Tanzu. So what did you hear, Keith, in Europe? What's your latest thinking on VMware's prospects in cross-cloud services slash super cloud? So I, I think our, our friend and uh, 
cube alum host. Stu would be even more offended at this statement than he was when I sat in the queue. This was maybe five years ago. There's no company better suited to help industries or companies cross the cross cloud chasm than VMware. That's not a compliment. That's a reality of the industry. This is a very difficult almost intractable problem. What I heard at VMware Europe were customers serious about this problem. Even more so than the US, data sovereignty is a real problem in the EU. Try being a company in Switzerland and having the Swiss e, uh, data sovereignty issues and there's no local cloud presence there large enough to accommodate your data needs. They had very serious questions about this. I talked to open source project leaders. Open source project leaders were asking me, why should I use the public cloud to host Kubernetes-based workloads? My projects that are building around Kubernetes and the CNCF infrastructure, why should I use AWS, Google, or even Azure to host these projects when that's undifferentiated? I, I, I know how to run Kubernetes, so why not run it on premises? But they're getting dealing with the, I don't want to deal with the hardware problems. So again, really great questions. And then there was always the specter of the, the problem I think we all had with the acquisition of VMware by Broadcom potentially $4.5 billion in increased profitability in three years is an unbelievable amount of money when you look at the size of the problem. So a lot of the conversation in Europe was about Keith, industry at large, how do we do what regulators are asking us to do in a practical way from a true technology sense. Is VMware cross-cloud real? Yeah, so, so VMware, obviously, to your point, um, OpenStack is another way, but it's actually OpenStack, you know, uptake is still alive and well, especially, you know, in those regions where there may not be a public cloud or there's public policy dictating that. Walmart's using OpenStack, so they're, you know, some, as you know, in IT, some things never die. Um, question for Sanjeev. Um, and it relates to this new breed of data apps where, and, and Bob Muglia and Tristan Handy from D, DBT Labs who are participating in this program really got us thinking about this. You got data that resides in different clouds, maybe even on-prem, and the machine pulls data from different systems. No humans involved, e-commerce, ERP, et cetera. It creates a plan, outcomes, no human involvement. Today, you know, you're on a CRM system, you're inputting, you're doing forms, you're, you're, you're automating processes. We're talking about a new breed of apps. What are your thoughts on this? Um, is, it, is it real? Is it just way off in the distance? How does machine intelligence fit in? And how does super cloud fit? So uh, great, great uh, point. In fact, the data apps that you're talking about, I call them data products. Data products first came into limelight uh, in the last couple of years when Jamal Dugani started talking about data mesh. I am uh, I am taking data products out of the data mesh concept because data mesh, whether data mesh happens or not, is is analogous to uh, to data products. Data products basically are are taking a product management view of bringing data from different sources based on what the consumer needs. The uh, it, you know we were talking earlier uh, uh, today about uh, maybe it's my you know uh, vacation rentals and or it may be a retail data product it may be an investment data product so so it's a prepackaged uh, extraction of data from different sources but now i have a product that uh, has a whole life cycle i can version it i have new uh, new features that get added and it's a very business data consumer centric 
It uses machine learning. For instance, I may, uh, I may be able to tell whether this data product has stale data, who's using that data. Based on the usage of, of the data, I may have a new data products that get uh, allocated. I may even have the ability to take existing data products, mash them up into something that, that I need. So if I'm going to have that kind of power to create a data product, then having a common substrate underneath, it can be very useful. And that could be super cloud, where I'm making API calls. I don't care where the ERP, the CRM, the survey data, the pricing engine, where they sit. For me, there's a logical abstraction and then I'm building my data product on top of that. So I see a new breed of products coming out, data products coming out. To answer your question, how early we are, or is this even possible? I, I uh, My uh, prediction is that in 2023, we will start seeing more of data products, and then it'll take maybe two to three years for data products to become mainstream, but it's starting this year. Hey, subprime mortgages were a data product, but <laughs> definitely were humans involved. All right, let's talk about some of the super cloud, multi-cloud players and what their future looks like. You can kind of pick your favorites. VMware, Snowflake, Databricks, Red Hat, Cisco, Dell, HPE, Hashi, IBM, Cloudflare, there's, there's, there's many others, Cohesity, Rubrik. Keith, I wanted to start with Cloudflare because they actually use the term super cloud. Um, and just simplifying what they said, they look at it as a, you know, taking serverless to the max. You write your code and then you can deploy it in seconds worldwide, of course, across the cloud for infrastructure. You know, you don't have to spin up containers. You don't got to provision instances. Cloudflare worries about all that infrastructure. What are your thoughts on Cloudflare and this approach and their chances to disrupt the current cloud landscape? You know, as uh, Larry Ellison said famously once before, the network is the computer, right? You know, Wait, I thought that was Scott McNeely. <laughs> it wasn't Scott and Lily. I, I knew it was someone Oracle aligned. Uh, yeah, it's the, it, Oracle owns that by, now. Owns that by line. by <laughs> by by, by, uh, by purpose or acquisition. It, it was, they should have just called it cloud. Yeah, they should have just called it. <laughs> easier. But if you think about the Cloudflare capability, Cloudflare in its own right is becoming a decent sized cloud provider. If you have compute out at the edge, when we talk about edge in the sense of cloud fit flare and points of presence literally across the globe, you have all this SS compute, what do you do with it? First offering, let's, let's disrupt data in the cloud. We can't start the conversation without talking about data. When they say, you know, we're going to give you object oriented or object storage in the cloud with foul egress charges, that's disruptive. That we can start to think about super cloud capability of having compute EC2 run in AWS, pushing, pushing and pulling data from uh, Cloudflare. And now I'm I've disrupted this Roach Motel data structure and that I'm freely giving away bandwidth basically. Well, the next layer is not that much more difficult. And I, I think part of Cloudflare's serverless approach or super cloud approach is so that they don't have to commit to a certain type of compute. It is advantageous. It is, it is a feature for me to be able to go to EC2 and pick a memory heavy model or a, uh, a compute heavy model or a network heavy model. Cloudflare is taking away those knobs and I'm just giving uh, code and allowing that to run. Cloudflare has a massive network. If I can put the code closest using the Cloudflare workers, if I can put the, that code closest to where the data is at or residing, super compelling observation. The question is, does it scale? Uh, I don't get the 238 services. While server list is great, I have to know what I'm going to build. I don't have a 
Cognito or RDS or all these other services that make AWS, GCP, and Azure appealing from a builder's perspective. So uh, it is a very interesting nascent start. And it's, uh, it's great because now they can high compute. If they don't have the capacity, they can outsource that maybe at a cost to one of the other cloud providers. But kind of hiding the compute behind the serverless architecture is a really unique approach. Yeah, and they're dipping their toe in the water and uh, they've announced an object store and a, and a database platform and, and more to come. Um, we got to wrap, so I, I wonder Sanjeev and then Maribel, if you could maybe pick some of your favorites for, from a competitive you know, standpoint. Sanjeev, I, I felt like just watching Snowflake, I said, okay, in my opinion, they had the right strategy, which was to you know, run on all the clouds and then try to create that abstraction layer and data sharing across clouds, even though you know, let's face it, most of it might be happening across regions if it's, if it's happening, but certainly outside of an individual account. But I felt, felt like just observing them that anybody who's, you know, a traditional on-prem player moving into the clouds or anybody who's a cloud native, it just makes total sense to write to the, to, to the various clouds. And to the extent that you can simplify that for users, it seems to be a logical strategy. Maybe, as I said before, what multi-cloud should have been but are there companies that you're watching that you think are ahead in the game or ones that you think are a good model for the future? Yes, I, I, Snowflake definitely. In fact, one of the things we have not touched upon very much and Keith mentioned a little bit was data sovereignty. Uh, data residency rules uh, can require that certain data should be written into certain region uh, of a certain cloud, you know, and if, if uh, my cloud provider can abstract that uh, or, or my database provider, then th that's perfect for me. So I, I right now I see Snowflake is uh, way ahead of this pack. I would not uh, uh, put MongoDB too far behind. They don't really talk about this thing. They are in a, in a different space, but now they have a lake house and they've got all of these uh, other SQL access and new capabilities that they're announcing. So I think they would be quite uh, quite good with that. Oracle is always a dark horse. Oracle seems to have revived its, uh, its cloud mojo uh, to some extent, and it's doing some uh, interesting stuff. Databricks is, a, is the other one. Uh, I have not seen uh, Databricks. They've been very focused on Lake House, Unity, Data Catalog, and some of those pieces, but they would be the obvious challenger. And if they come into this, this space uh, of a super cloud, then they may bring some open source technologies that others can, can rely on, like Delta Lake uh, as a table format. Yeah, and if I'm you know one of these infrastructure players, Dell, HPE, Cisco, even IBM, I mean, I would be making my infrastructure as programmable and cloud friendly as possible. Uh, that seems like table stakes, but Maribel, any, any companies that stand out to you that we should be paying attention to? Well, you know, we already mentioned a bunch of them, so maybe I'll go a different, a slightly different route. Uh, I'm watching two companies pretty closely to see what kind of traction they get in their established companies. One we already talked about, which is VMware. And the thing that's interesting about VMware is they're everywhere. And they also have the benefit of having a foot in both camps. If you want to do it the old way, the way you've always done it with VMware, they got all that going on. If you want to try to do a more uh, cross-cloud, multi-cloud, cloud-native style thing, they're really trying to build tools for that. So I think they have really good access to buyers. And that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in them to see how they how, how they progress. The other thing I think could be a sleeping horse, oddly enough, is um, Google Cloud. You know, uh, they've spent a lot of work on uh, and time on Anthos. They really need uh, to create a certain set of differentiators. While it's not necessarily in their best interest to be the best multi-cloud player, if they decide that they want to differentiate on a different layer of the stack, let, let's say they want to be like the person that is really transformative, you know, they talk about transformation cloud with analytics workloads, then maybe they do spend a good deal of time trying to help people abstract all of the other underlying infrastructure and make sure that they get the sexiest, most, um, meaningful workloads into their cloud. So those are those are two people that you might not have expected me to go with, but I think it's interesting to see not just on the things that might be considered uh, either startups or more established independent companies, but how some of the traditional providers are trying to reinvent themselves as well. 
I'm glad you brought that up because you've been thinking about what Google's done with Kubernetes. I mean, would Google even be relevant in the cloud without Kubernetes? I, I, you could argue both sides of that, but you know, it was, it was quite a gift to the industry. And there's there's a motivation there to to do something unique and different from maybe the other cloud providers. You know, and I'd throw in Red Hat as well. They're obviously a, a key player in Kubernetes, and and HashiCorp seems to be becoming the standard. You know, for 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 application deployment and Terraform across clouds, and there are many, many others. Uh, you know, I'm, I know we're leaving lots out, but we're out of time, folks. I got to thank you so much for your insights and your participation in in SuperCloud Two. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank right, this, you. This is Dave Vellante for John Furrier and the entire Cube community. Keep it right there for more content from SuperCloud Two.